we are live. Welcome to 2009's Daybreaker Review and Thoughts Films. Now, see, I realize this video is long, but if you're, if you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. To see this link, check the time codes in the description box. I'm currently dealing with some back pain, but I still have a lot to say about the movies I watch, so I'm going to speak faster until my back feels better. Feel free to slow this down. Now, I start this video with a review, most likely with zero spoilers. If I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so. And hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead, which you see me lower my index finger. As soon as I end the review itself and go into the thoughts section, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for the movie, including discussing the ending. Now, this video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. The most visual it gets is when I sometimes act something out, so feel free to watch something visual such as clips from the movie, in another tab, I won't mind. Now, I got this on sale, so anything negative to say in this video is not out of bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to other vampire movies. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I said in this video are fair criticism based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. Now... Since we're still dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video, it's possible that I will touch my face. I want to assure you, I've washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. Now, I watched the the unseen cut of this. It's, you know, I unseen is the only one I have seen. I don't know if that's ironic or coincidental, but, yeah, you know, I, I, I can't say if it's better or worse than the others, but I can say I, you know, it's 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 worth watching. It's not like, you know, as yeah, as a quick example, if you're buying this online, if you buy it via, like, German Amazon or something, make sure that it's, like, just, you know, it will... The Germans have a tendency to really censor a lot out of movies, so just make sure you don't get screwed like that. Anyway... I have watched this somewhere between two times and four times. I first watched it in 2010, and the most recent viewing was right before I started recording this video, so that it would be fresh in my mind. So, in the movie, it's the plot. It's the year 2019. About a decade ago, vampires began taking over out of various of our weaknesses, fear of death, vanity, etc. Most of us give in. There's now only a small human resistance left fighting for the race's survival. The Bitten have a similar problem. They've dealt with sunlight, and it's not that there are a few of them, it's the opposite. They're running out of what they need to live. People are being farmed for their blood, but it's still getting to be sparse in amount. You see, they didn't stop to think that there might be a finite supply of it. Yes, I realize I really should have reviewed this in 2019. You know, Maven of the Eventide got that right. The off-the-shelf review guys also only got to it this year. Lindsay Ellis just put out an excellent video talking about how the Disney animated The Little Mermaid. In it, she says that mermaids like the Danish don't have souls? Okay, fair enough. And the taglines for this movie are, In 2019, the most precious natural resource is us. The battle between immortality and human humanity is on. The battle for blood begins. But yeah, so this the movie was set ten years into the future. Now you know they, they did they did almost get it right. The it's it's not that in the year twenty nineteen you know the, the world wasn't run by vampires, but you know America was run by Donald Trump until recently, so, you know, yeah, soulless monster who, whose skin looks weird. Now, if this is nothing you've never heard of, this is an action, according to IMDb, it's an action-adventure fantasy horror sci-fi thriller. Yeah, it does kind of fit into all of those. From 2009, and it was written and directed by Michael and Peter Spierig, aka the Spierig Brothers. Now, yeah, the the metaphor of you know running out of something that you need to live is is great. 
I saw a another reviewer suggest that it's about Republicans, and I agree, and I would extend it to, in general, anyone that takes advantage of other people in their environment for their own benefit in a bottomless pit of greed in a refusal to live in healthy moderation. The movie does a great job at communicating that, as the excellent YouTuber Lucky Black Hat just a few days ago pointed out in a video, what those in power claim to be a meritocracy is really a kleptocracy. I doubt she's watching this video, but if she is, don't feel bad, I have to look up words in the dictionary too. And the talented YouTube reviewer, The Maven of the Eventide, points out that as of 2019, the movie actually is much more topically applicable to climate change than the fossil fuel crisis. This is one of the most original, great, and smart of these movies. It may be matched in other mediums, however, and there have been a lot of entries in this subgenre. I'm not sure I know any other vampire movie where the vampires are legitimately a majority, having taken over humanity's place, and are living in a society that really resembles human society. I've seen some where they theorize what would vampire society look I mean, yeah, there's a lot of those. You know, Blade Underworld off the top of my head. But the... I, and I think I've seen other vampire movies where the vampires are the vast majority, but then they didn't live in a society that really resembles ours. And we could be on, on Wikipedia. Ethan Hawke described the film as an allegory of man's pacing with natural resources. We're eating our own resources, so people are trying to come up with blood substitutes, trying to get us off of foreign humans. Now, there are a number of different ways to do fiction dealing with, for example, vampires. But really, this goes for a lot of different supernatural creatures. I would argue that if you don't want to miss the mark with something like that, a piece of fiction has to say something and or be entertaining. It doesn't have to be both, but if it's neither, it failed. This movie goes for both, and it definitely does have something to say, and I would argue it's also entertaining. Actually, I suppose there are probably more people who would say that the the message is isn't isn't as good as the movie maybe thinks it is. I, th I think most people who don't hate this movie probably would agree that it is fairly entertaining at least. Now I do understand those who say that it's too on the nose, but let's not pretend like stories about vampires don't have something to say. That's always been the case. Again, not all of them do, but the vampire was made to comment on issues. You know. I, it's been a while since I looked at the very original, but I think, wasn't it originally about, like, having trouble restraining your, your sexual urges, and hence penetration, and, like, the, the, and, and it was about how the upper class will literally live off of the lower class, you know, so there's always been a message there. Now, so yeah, vam vampires are used as a way for the film to comment on all the problems that come about due to our reliance on oil. Thankfully today a lot of new technology has been invented that can help us go green, but it probably will take a while and people who refuse to change will fight it every step of the way, even those not making a fortune of it. And now, in this movie, that fight is literal, like there, there are, there's a vampire military in this movie that fight those who try to, to change things. In real life, obviously, it's not quite, it's, it's not a literal military, you know, but it's a good metaphor for how hard they're fighting to, to prevent change. In real life, they aren't killing people over it, but they are fighting, you know, they're fighting it so heartily that you might think it was literally about survival or that, like, yeah, or, you know, I mean, technically it is life or death, but life or death right now. I really appreciate that the movie realizes that if vampires were the majority, then life would largely be the same. I forget if it's the Scarlet Pimpernel who points out you still need someone to scrub the toilets. Maybe it was a line in Bioshock 2. Maybe it's both. I'm a social democrat, so I believe that people who work really lousy jobs should be working under as good conditions as possible. And by as possible, I do mean no tax cuts for the rich until every single person who works a job is properly taken care of with good wages, pensions, etc. 
but yeah, the, the movie inverts the escapism so that it can comment on consumerism. Even if everyone were a vampire, we'd still have to deal with running out of natural resources. Now, there are other movies that comment on over-reliance on oil, but I'm not sure I know of any other where it's like vampires that are used to... Yeah. Now, the... I do kind of love this movie, so I, I hope I'm not going to sound like a total apologist for it, but I will try to defend it on some of the things, some of the criticisms I've heard leveled at this just make no sense to me. I'm not saying you can't criticize it. 100%. There are definitely criticisms that can be made of this movie, but yeah, I'll, I'll get to them over the course of the video. Now, let's see. Yeah, so the I, I would say that the movie, like the metaphor is more important to the movie than the characters themselves. And I think it, it, there probably are people who would say that the movie is style over substance. I didn't get around to reading all the reviews that I had hooked to. Now, the I'm doing more like this list compares this to 30 Days of Night, which is also about vampires that, you know, that there are so many, or, yeah, so many of the vampires that they're, that they need a lot of blood to get by. It's been, right, and yeah, I gave Third Days of Night a 7 out of 10, and it's been compared to The Crazies from 2010, not the original, uh, George A. Romero one. And yeah, I also gave that a 7 out of 10. I'm not sure I would say that I mean, they're both violent horror movies that are set roughly today in, in society. Yeah, I'm not sure what else. They, yeah, And Underworld Rise of the Lycans, which I also gave it a 7, which, yeah, the, the fact that there's some empathy for characters you might not expect. 28 weeks later, that I can definitely see, with, with both of them having, like, a military force that's out to, to stop some that that are perceived to, to end the, the, the race. In that, in that one, it's the human race. In this one, it's the vampire race. And the first Underworld, which I gave a 6 out of 10. And other than that, there's, of course, you know, Twilight and True Blood put vampires back in movies and on TV. It's possible that this movie wouldn't have gotten made, at least not when it did, if not for Twilight. I have not watched any of the Twilight movies. I'd like to think that if I did... I would be as forgiving as Lindsay Ellis in her video, Dear Stephanie Meyer. It's also been compared to Children of Men, and there's definitely, yes, the, the palpable sense of desperation, of, of fear that we won't go on living much longer if something doesn't change soon. Now, the title, I, I sometimes for these videos try to go into, does the title have special significance? I mean, in this, it just refers to vampires, so it's not really specific to this movie. It could be about any other vampire movie. And, you know, their movie about zombies was just called Undead. I don't know, maybe they need outside help to come up with more compelling specific titles. Like, I, I mean, it's not really a problem as such, but I just feel that there are a lot of things you could name. Like, once again, this is, this is a... a movie that has a very specific concept. Like, hypothetically, if someone's talking to you and, and they're saying, so there's this vampire movie where, like, vampires rule everything, society looks a lot like ours, you'd almost immediately give, oh, you're talking about Daybreakers. And they might not be able to remember the title because Daybreakers is such a, such an utterly generic title when, like, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know exactly what... I, I, I'm not good at coming up with titles, but just, I'm saying there's there's a lot more interesting titles that you could use for this. Like, I mean, even something, like, I've, I've heard some criticized saying, like, the, the title of Underworld. Oh, it's so on the nose. It's an underworld. Yeah, but you remember it, though. Like, as much as that movie franchise, as much as those movies look like knockoff Matrix sequels, you remember, like, when you hear the word Underworld, you think of it, and it's not even, 
the, there's at least one movie called Underworld that's literally just about a criminal underworld. And when you say the word Underworld, no one thinks you're talking about that one. Everyone realizes, oh right, Kate Beckinsale in, in like latex, full body suit. Yeah. Now, for these videos, I sometimes go into whether at least one person making a movie has something to prove. I would definitely say that the Spirit Brothers want to make a strong impression. This is only their second feature, and while I have to admit this is the only one I've watched of theirs, I can, you know, thankfully say this movie's ten years old. They've made, like, what, three movies since then. So, you know, this was not the last hurrah. That They got to keep making movies, and some of those movies are very popular. And I've seen some people say that Ethan Hawke and Willem Dafoe are basically just coasting. I don't, I don't really agree with that, though. Now, I decided to review this because I, I think it's extremely important to have these kinds of allegory stories. We really need to, you know, yeah, to convince people... We, we have to take action. And that is also the same reason that I bought it in the first place. So, yeah, as far as, you know, other than the, the genres, the subgenres that this goes, to in, goes into, fits into, dystopian future, corporate dystopia, and post-apocalypse. And, yeah, so once again, it's an action-adventure fantasy horror sci-fi thriller, and, yeah, I mean... The action is exciting, it's not ashamed of the fantasy roots, the horror thriller aspects are scary at times, and the sci-fi does stimulate your brain, so it makes for a pretty good entry in each of those genres. I heard a rumor that this was originally supposed to be the fourth Blade movie, but then Wesley Snipes got into his trouble with the IRS. I have no idea if this rumor is true or not, but the following that I'm about to say doesn't need it to be true. I'm glad that this is not a Blade movie, because I don't think they would have been as gutsy about the satire. And I say that as someone who loves the first Blade movie and the TV show, although I'm not going to lie, that obviously the TV show has some issues. And, well, I can acknowledge that the second movie is well made, which is essentially... I wish that I could... No, that's a tangent. Um, And I think their hearts were in the right place when they made the third one. Now, yeah, so the Spirit Brothers wrote this, and in 2003 un they put out Undead, 2014 Predestination, 2018 Winchester, and at, at some point this year they're in pre-production for something called False Flag. Now, let's see. So, the f yeah, the first half of this has you believing it will be excellent, and the second lets us down a bit. And early on, the story is very engaging, there are a lot of surprises, and then it starts growing stale. You know, I've, I've read that in, in the... In, in Undead, they also, you know, they also wrote and directed that. They... In that one, the plot also didn't work all the way through the movie, you know, at, at a point, it just, yeah. Also, apparently, at least one of the movies they've made since doesn't have, like, one of the, I don't think there's something wrong with, you know, like, okay, so the first movie they made was Zombies, the second movie was Vampires. I don't think there would be something wrong with, like, let's see, uh, Werewolves for example, next, or something, but I know that a lot of people do, so I'm, I'm glad that they've moved outside of, yeah. I quite like that the humans know they can't kill all the vampires, and so they have to solve the domination issue in a different way. And the movie manages to fit in the man-sized bat vampire, the Nosferatu, the vampires that just have fangs and pointed ears feeding on humans, we have vampires being killed with stabbing weapons. The humans, 
believe the solution is to turn vampires back into humans, or metaphorically, to learn to not overuse natural resources. You know, being a vampire means you you over, yeah, overuse resources. Yeah, and and it's it's a good metaphor because you know what's the the first thing when you think of vampires? Oh, they they suck blood out of humans. Well, they're gonna run out of humans eventually, you know, and that's yeah. And in this movie, the you know, it's been 10 years since the, the first vampire, so they've had some time to adjust. So there's been, like, there, there's, like, new technology, and, and society has been adjusted. So, you know, they, they have, they can drive during the day with UV shields covering the windows. And, uh, like, there's a, there's a camera on the, on the front of the car, and the, the, like, uh, what's it called? The, the monitor for it is the the is is where you you know you usually just look yeah today we just look through the actual what are those called again I'm not a I'm not a car person yeah the the front front window you know but here they have to watch the the monitor and the camera because that doesn't let in any sunlight and they have all these things. They they walk underground instead of walking like on the on the sidewalk or something during the day, and they they take blood in the coffee instead of creamer and just yeah. Now let's see. Yeah. So quoting Polo Critic here. The story will at times lurch from thing to thing in a none too natural manner. I was frequently wanting to stop and ask questions about why and how, since little seems clear unless you just take it all on faith. I couldn't do that because the film was asking me to believe too many impossible things. The result was I was loving the pieces but only kind of liking the whole. An another it says, in a way, the setup somewhat reminds me of the film Equilibrium with vampires added into the mix. Very true. It's, it's, yeah. And I think that's a good thing. I realize some people might think it's a bad thing. Equilibrium is a better movie. Equilibrium has very, very little wrong with it at all. There's a bit more issue with this one. Now, the... Yeah, the previous work of the talented pair of twin brothers was along the same lines, the undead, with more of a zombie flavor utilized. They seem to enjoy exploring the concept of a natural calamity resulting in a drastic societal paradigm shift. Now, this is a concept that needs a lot of explaining before you're willing to accept it. I would say that a lot of the way it does a pretty good job explaining it handles plot twists fairly well. There are not too many. I think an argument could be made that one or two of them are at best decent, possibly even bad. And some people said they had an easy time figuring out the twists. I think most of them you don't really guess. It's not difficult to keep up with all the twists. You don't need to check Wikipedia or watch it more than once. But yeah, so the... Right, the... the yeah, so I already mentioned the, the movies that the Spirit Brothers wrote. They, they directed all the ones they wrote, but there's also... They directed one that they didn't write, 2017's Jigsaw. And yes, that is in fact one of the Saw movies. And... You know, like the this is still the only one I've watched by by them. I don't think, as much as I love this one, I don't think I'm willing to watch like because I mean even I I would have to watch all of the other sequels right to because because they like all of them like have you know all of them expand on on the overall plot. So I yeah I don't think I'm I I watched the first one that was more than enough. 
I think it's you you can definitely tell that the brothers you know they chose to work on this this was their idea this was their baby the the, the it wasn't that they were like you know director for hire you know so some directors for hire also do really throw in they they give it the best they got but you can you can sometimes really tell if someone was asked to do something or if they came up with their own idea and yeah I will almost definitely watch more of the things written and directed by the Spirit Brothers. Now, the very first shot of this movie is this dark sky. I'm not entirely sure if the sun is setting or rising. I've never been good at... I, I know there's like a way you're supposed to be able to tell. I'm not good at that. And a bat dramatically flies into the shot and shrieks. And the, the first thing we see after this is this, like... See, depending on who you ask, this girl is a child, a tween, or a teen. I think I'm going to split the difference and go with tween. There is a tween vampire writing a note. She leaves it on her bed, opens the door, walks out, sits waiting for the sun to rise, and we see her eye color. You know, she's got the, the yellow, you know, yeah, that we... Not all vampires. Hashtag not all vampires. But some vampires have the, the yellow eyes. Yeah. And yeah, she commits suicide sitting in the in the sun. And we, we briefly see some of the letter and you know some of the text says, never change, never grow up, can't go on. And yeah, this really gory graphic. You know, we see her face as she burns to death. It's a very cheap way to get tragedy. The movie doesn't explore her experiences leading to the suicide, her family's reaction to the suicide. It's thus using a serious su subject in a tasteless manner. And it definitely didn't have to be a tween. Thankfully, the film gets a lot better. You know, I mean, it, I don't think it would have... Yeah, first of all, it's not, it's not necessary at all, and I don't, don't get me wrong, I, I get, I, I would also hate having to stay the, the same age for, yeah. One thing that this does do well is, immediately it tells you, this is a story about vampires that despite the positives of being a vampire, this world is simply unsustainable, it cannot go on in the long term, and that's a, quite good. And and to be fair, the this poor girl, she did try for ten years. You know, the we, we see the calendar. It's been, you know, it's twenty nineteen, so she must have been a bit, well, I suppose it's possible she didn't turn right away, but certainly for many, many years now she's been a vampire. And the yeah, so the the opening, you know, af after that we have this news story where this one guy argues humans were given a chance to assimilate, and since they didn't, it's okay to use them for blood. So, yeah, no one ever claimed this movie was subtle. And the opening titles show these somber shots of sunlit cities, you know, you have streets, you have outside of buildings, and they're all empty of people since they're all vampires. And we see some of the technology that's been invented to allow the vampires to go about relatively normal human lives during the day. And yeah, so the ending... Okay, so I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending. Does the ending fit what, with what came before? More or less, yes. I wish I was happy with how the movie ends. The, yeah, the ending uses really convenient writing to, to wrap things up. Like, if you, if you sit down and try to watch this movie and you don't pay attention to how much of the movie is left, I, I think maybe, maybe around like 15 minutes, 10, 10, 15 minutes are left of the movie. Suddenly it's going to hit you. The movie's about to end, isn't it? Holy crap, the movie's about to end, even with all this that hasn't, like, it definitely needed to be a longer movie. It's, the ending doesn't resolve everything, and, let's see. 
yeah, the conclusion is a rather tough pill to swallow. So many threads are left hanging. Honestly, it feels like they had half of a fantastic strip and didn't want to smooth out the rest of it, or like they had to settle because they ran out of money. The climax is rushed, abrupt, and resolves it all too easily, taking away from the power of the rest of the film. And really, honestly, if I had to guess, I don't think they ran out of money. I I guess maybe they just didn't, they, they thought that it would be sufficient. Now, the ending titles kind of let you sit with the ending, which is, I, I would say, the, the right choice. And some some of the, like, with, with the music and such, it, it has somewhat of an overpowering effect. And... The movie doesn't really lose your interest along the way. Now, I would definitely say you can tell that this was made by people who love vampire movies. And for people who... Now... I like that it subverts expectations. The, the vampire domination of humankind... Yeah. And, yeah, so, you know, the vampires have super strength, they're, well, yeah, in, in some of the lore, they're, they're super, they have super speed. I suppose in this, they're maybe slightly faster than human beings, and in vulnerability to everything except sunlight, garlic, and being staked through the heart, and, yeah, it does a good job following, like, doing things with, like, there's, there's a... I suppose I won't give away how many, but there's at least one fight where literally a vampire throws someone across the room, like they f five meters or something, and they they hit hard, like s just flying through the room, hitting the the wall and crashing down. Just so so yeah, and. Now the let's see. yeah the movie does get you to feel empathy for the characters you're meant to and deep searing hatred for at least some of the characters that you're meant to really hate. Now Yeah, so the, the um, quoting a fellow critic, Willem Dafoe is a delight, bringing tremendous energy to his borderline over-the-top interpretation of Elvis, the best of the bunch, is pos probably Claudia Carvan, an established Australian who has been appearing in films since she was a child in the 80s, but who is relatively unknown outside of her native country. I have to admit, I, I should have looked up if that has changed since this movie came out. I hope it has. She's very talented. And, yeah. One, one, one of my issues with this, you find yourself realizing the characters aren't particularly developed in spite of all the time you spend with them. The acting isn't bad, or I wasn't blown away by anyone, and I think Defoe got unintentional laughs. Ethan Hawke plays Edward Dalton, a 35-year-old vampire hematologist who was turned by his brother Frankie and started working for the newly formed Bromley Marks to work on a blood substitute. And yeah, and he he refuses to drink human blood instead of relying on animal blood. And he he has this very good subdued performance. You know that you can really tell that he didn't want to become a vampire. He never. It's, you know, and, and now he, you know, there's no, it's, it, you know, it's, it's not like, it's not a, it's not a club you can just join and then later leave. This is, this is basically permanent, you know, and he, he's been working on it. Yeah, I guess he's been working on it for all 10 years, for an entire decade, and they still don't have something, you know, so, yeah, you can understand why he is, 
he's not like super happy even you know so, some of the people in this movie are quite happy where they are and they'll they'll smile showing off their fangs now let's see yeah so Willem Dafoe I was I, I you know when you go into a Willem Dafoe movie you have to wonder is he gonna ham it up the way he does in the Spider-Man movies in Speed 2 he doesn't particularly know he's introduced talking about the solution to the vampire problem so from right away you think of him as yeah this is yeah and Michael Dorman plays Edward's brother and he I suppose yeah I'm not sure I can say very much about him without spoiling I think he gives a good performance I, I found it convincing and Sam Neill plays Charles Bromley, a corporate CEO. Yeah, I know. No one's surprised that corporate CEOs still exist once everyone's a vampire. Even in the real world right now, corporate CEOs are soulless monsters. His performance is great. He loves being evil, which Sam Neill does really well. And this, you know, I... I don't usually tell people that they should watch Event Horizon, but if the damage has already been done, you may remember that he's good at playing evil in that movie. And... Yeah, and, and basically, you know, the, the human resistance, like, some, some humans go around gathering humans and sheltering them from vampires. And... I don't have a lot to say about Isabella Lucas, con considering that her name is, like, on, on the cover... Her name is up there with Ethan Hawke, Willem Dafoe, and Sam Neill. They have more screen time than she does. If you know, if you're like a fan of hers, don't expect her to be in all that much of this movie. She's she does a decent job, I I thought. But there's really not anything I can say about her character without spoiling. Now, let's see. But but yeah the you know the movie let's see. yeah the the dialogue is flat and stereotypical you know characters will say things like we're about to change all of that and nowhere is safe and it comes off hollow now for for some of the characters we see. You know, we see what they're like when things are going well, how they respond to things going wrong. And I would say that after watching this movie, some of the more tragic aspects of it will stay with you for a while after. Not as long as the Spears brothers really hoped it would, but that, that I, I feel like some, some reviewers... Are, are too hard on it for, for that. I do really think that some of the some of the tragedy really really does work. It it has weight to it. Now the cinematography was handled by Ben Knott, who has worked on quite a few other things, and he's actually he's worked on several of the things that the brothers have made. So clearly they like working together. The yeah, you know the. I don't think there's any handheld. There, there is some steady cam shots. There are some absolutely incredible looking shots as far as composition, action within the frame, such as vampires fighting humans. I won't give away exactly what it is, but there's one shot very close to the end, and like. It's it's breathtaking. It is 
just absolutely all breathtaking, yeah. And this was edited by Matt Villa, and I haven't seen anything else he's edited, but he's also edited several other things that the brothers have worked on, so, and, let's see, yeah, uh, one of my fellow critics called it, said that his editing keeps Daybreakers to a brisk 98 minutes of crushing horror gore and thoughtful sci-fi drama about the ethics of harming humans for blood to sake vampiric thirsts. Another, uh, called it crisp editing, and... One pointed out some of the editing for instance feel, feels unnatural. And yeah, so the yeah, a fellow critic said you know the film had cold steely blue black and gray matrixy look and another critic said the spirits have created an unsettlingly believable world part blade runner part gattaca part blade and another said much of the film looks like a vampire film noir it looks like a sam spade will come wandering in at any moment and it's gothic but yeah it's 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 very very it, it has a very distinct look. It's it's not a it's it's not a look you haven't seen before, but it does still like yeah. And the special effects are very good. There are a couple of times where you can kind of tell that you're looking at an effect. You know, this was an independent movie. But the yeah, tiny bit of the CGI, you can tell that it was, yeah. They, they went practical where they could, including the bat-like vampires, and worked out really well. There, there's, yeah, this is not a spoiler. Some of the bat-like vampires can, you know, walk upside down on, on the ceiling. And I've seen bat behind the scenes stuff they did that for real they didn't just like have them walking on you know normally and then they flip the shot no no, no. they had this guy on wires walking upside down and yeah it, it like when you watch the movie it looks like you're watching a bat a a human bat you know for for them walking upside down is perfectly natural and the they do really good on the stunts. The there are some scenes where the you you might expect them to use like digital doubles, but once again, I've I've seen some behind the scenes footage. They used real people in these really detailed scenes, and yeah, the stunts really help sell the reality of it. The budget was twenty million. And the box office was 51.4. Now, this was filmed in Australia. And right all the way back in 2007. So, they, yeah, they spent quite a bit of time on post-production. And now... You know, we, we see the, the blood farms. Considering how much the movie's look already resembles the Matrix, I would say they should have made the blood farms look much more different from the fields where human beings are grown, not born from the Matrix one. I don't know, maybe they felt they should go all the way. They do look very convincing. Like, And you see this this really nasty... Like, you, you see these human beings just... Yeah, hung there to be farmed for blood. And it's not a surprise. Uh, of course, we knew it had to work that way. But yeah, you do see a close-up of the neck of one of them. And you see, yeah, they're breathing. They're alive. They are using 
human being. They're they're just they're barely you know they're keeping them alive so that they can take their blood, but they're you know just yeah really really horrifying. Now, let's see. so as far as the action action goes, the yeah, very it's very intense and exciting action, and you know there are chases both on foot and vehicular. There are shootouts, minor physical fights, yeah. and and you know the action isn't. As big as like a big budget flick from 2009, but let's see. I have to address some people. Seem, some people say that it seems like the vampire military is always trying to kill the human beings, despite them being the only source of blood. And I think maybe also when when they talk about it in the movie, they do call it hunting humans, but. I would say when we see the vampire military, I'm not going to claim that they never seem to be shooting to kill. I would say that that's only when they perceive them to be an immediate threat. Otherwise, they will try to take them alive. Many, many times you see them using trank darts. I think maybe some people got too hung up on the fact that we see them carrying what at least look like regular pistols and submachine guns, but, you know... Yeah, they almost always use trank darts. I'm, I'm not 100% certain. We, we, at least once we see a, what looks like a regular gun actually be a regular gun, I'm not sure there are that many shots where we see what they are firing that fires tranks. We usually just see the tranks hit people. So I'm not sure if those regular looking guns are trank. Yeah. Now, there's some pretty good use of gore and violence in this, and the paranoia. The the antagonist, yeah, I would probably say Charles, played by Sam Neill, is probably the main antagonist. He could be more memorable. I would definitely say, I mean, there are a lot of memorable vampire villains out there. And, I, yeah, this one wasn't that, I mean, that maybe the part of the thing is that he is basically, he has to go, the, the, the way the character is written is specifically for the allegory. And, you know, the, the, yeah. You know, it's evil, but it we've seen more evil vampires, you know. Now, the scenes are easy to follow, and they're meant to, and I think that was the right choice. The music, some of it is, like, loud and aggressive. The If I had to try to describe it, Christopher Gordon, some of his score in this, especially, like, during action scenes, it kind of sounds like someone is using a hammer to pound on a steel door as if they're trying to break it down and get in. There's this very intense, visceral quality to it. And... It's suspenseful and tense. And the sound design does a good job on things that aren't real, you know, vampire bites, transformations and such, they sound really great. And it's one of those things, like, if you want to, to test it out, just try to watch um, a movie, move, a, a scene of a, of a vampire, you know, someone transforming into a vampire. Try to mute it. It's way less effective, because we kind of need the, the audio there. Or, convert, or add, you know, conversely, or close your eyes and just listen. You know, it's really you. You don't notice it as much when you when you get both vid visual and audio. But if you if you only get one of them, you really notice how much. Like, cause 
I mean, you know, for us to believe that it's real, you have to make a big show of it. And, yeah, and they do a good job of that here. Now, let's see. There's some black and blue comedy. There's a lot of gruesome, gory violence and disturbing, at times disgusting content, a little strong language, and brief non-sexual nudity. But yeah, it's got gore for gore hounds, blood for the blood hounds, almost no nudity for the nudist dog breeds. I guess that's all dogs. And... Yeah, the level of realism, once you accept the whole vampires thing, it is very high. Like, the, there are a couple of things where it's like, wait, you, to you told us that they can't survive during the day outside of, the, of, of buildings or cars with UV shields, and yet, for a little bit of it, at least one character goes out and... And it's so weird, because they didn't have... They could have just written the scene slightly differently, and it would have worked fine. Anyway... You do, of course, somewhat need to suspend disbelief to enjoy it, but the laws of physics apply. To be fair, there are a lot of contrivances. Now... The pace is a bit off. For all that this movie wants to do, it's very short. It's an hour and 34 minutes, if you count the end credits, without them it's like 28. It is worth the investment of time, at least once, but it's, it, yeah, it is one of those things, if you're not interested, maybe 30 minutes in, the movie probably isn't your kind of thing. I wish that the movie was longer, maybe 30 minutes longer, you know, more, more character development, more plot. And, let's see, the movie is fairly preachy about moral, doesn't really have room for dissenting opinions. I'm, I'm not criticizing that, I'm just describing it. I would say the, the best element of the movie is the, the satire. And it is definitely worth watching at least once for that. Now, yeah, the, the worst aspect is the fact that it just kind of, the, 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 yeah, the, the last half of it is not as good. And, you know, it, it'll be less frustrating if you go into the movie knowing that the, la the second half of the movie isn't quite as good and the ending is, you know, but I can understand people who would rather just not watch it because of the, yeah. The worst aspect, according to others, is that it doesn't make sense. And, yeah, I, I think I see what they mean. I, it, ju it doesn't bother me the way it does them, I guess. And, yeah, I was probably most worried about it being preachy, and the movie did basically live down my expectations, but it didn't make me... I, I still love the movie, but it is... yeah. And the thing I was definitely most looking forward to was the satire, and my expectations were exceeded. Now, the movie leaves unanswered questions, and that is not a good thing. The trailer does give away at least a little bit too much. I I only found one trailer. It's two and a half minutes. It does give you a good idea of what the movie is like. You know, if you like the trailer, well, you know, you'll like the movie. If you don't like the trailer, you won't like the movie. P pretty much. It gets across the scariness and the the action and and you know, some important aspects of this world and, and such, but it makes it look like a bigger action movie than it is. And I can't help but wonder if that 
affected how well it did that some people went in expecting like a huge action movie and being disappointed told their friends that it wasn't as good as the trailer. Now the the cover and poster don't give away too much and do give you a decent idea of you know of what the movie is like. If you like cover or poster you might like the movie, if not you might not. But again it makes it look like a bigger budget action plate like the the cover features three attack helicopters which is three more that's in the than what's in the movie I I don't know why yeah and it, it just yeah the the I, f I feel like they should have instead used one of the... I, I mentioned that there's at least one shot that's just absolutely amazing. I think if they had put that on the poster or put... Well, I guess it's not really representative either. Anyway, they could have they could have done something else. But it does get the, the look across, the, the blue, steely kind of... Yeah. now so yeah you know the movie has metaphors and they, they tend to be very obvious it's not there, there aren't really a lot of difficult to understand elements the, the movie doesn't especially have difficult to understand elements there is some depth and there is some stuff to analyze you don't need to watch it more than once this is kind of the it, it is the kind of movie that shouldn't work but somehow does. And the reason that it works is because of how much thought was put into it. Like, it becomes clear that the, like, the world is, like, they, they put a lot of thought and effort into how would a vampire world work. And I actually, there was one reviewer who really hated that aspect and I think it's one of those things where if you don't like the idea of vampires living in a society that's very much like ours, but with adjustments so that vampires can be out during the day, more or less, if, if that doesn't appeal to you, and if you downright dislike that idea, this is not a movie for you. And, yeah, just straight up, they did not make this movie for people who don't like that. And if you don't like that, the movie might overall really bother you. But yeah the, yeah, the movie is way better than it has any right to be, more than you might expect it to be, might have heard that it is, although it has been relatively well received. And yeah, again, it's because of how they, they really thought through the, the core concept. Now, when I search on YouTube for videos about this, I'm going to briefly go into some of the ones I found. So I already mentioned the Maven of the Eventide made a video on it. It's 16 minutes. She does great analysis, as always. Do note, she spoils the film. She talks about everything, including the ending. So if you haven't already watched the movie, if you have any intention of watching the movie, make sure you watch the movie first. Because it will have no... It, it won't have the same impact at all if you watch her video first. And let's see. Yeah, the off the shelf review was quite good. 34 minutes. You know, as usual, they, they have interesting things to say about it. And as usual, they spoil everything in the movie. And yeah, the, on, on, the, on Rotten Tomatoes, this has a 69% based on 154 reviews and a 49% user you know, audience score based on over 100,000 ratings. And yeah, the critics consensus, though it arrives during an unfortunate glut of vampire movies, Daybreakers offers enough dark sci-fi thrills and enough of a unique twist on the genre to satisfy filmgoers. And on meta, on Metacritic, it, you know, the critic review is 57 out of 100, and the user 
rating is 6.7 out of 10. And on IMDb, it only has 6.4. And 335 IMDb user reviews. So, yeah, it, it is. I, I think the critics got it right. 69 out of 100. That is, yeah. And, yeah, this, this has an R rating for, from the MPAA, and that makes a lot of sense. I recommend this to fans of satire and or vampire flicks. And,. Yeah, so the DVD comes with an interesting and entertaining commentary track with the spirits. Note that they use explicit terms and get a tad graphic every now and then. And Steve Boyle, in which they point out cliches and are fairly honest. An 85-minute concise, informational, enjoyable documentary that covers a ton of ground, contains interviews and tiny scenes footage, clips and a few outtakes, and finally four trailers for other pictures. I would recommend getting this on DVD if you if you think you'll like the movie. The the special features are worth seeing. Yeah, but if you're just going to stream it, you know, I googled. Uh, depending on where you live, in some places it's on Netflix. In some places it's on Amazon Prime. Mm -hmm. So so yeah. I give this seven sharp fangs out of ten. Get it? Because sharp, like, well cut, but also sharp, like smart. I know my puns suck. I just really love sinking my teeth into this bloody good film. It has serious heart. Seriously, fangs a lot, Spirit Brothers. And that brings us to the thoughts section. Spoilers for the rest of the video, throughout the rest of the video, for the movie. And the section is entitled Thought Section Start Disclaimers. If you don't care about these disclaimers, I'll try to keep it short and well, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice in the description box. I often try to talk very fast during the disclaimers since a lot of this is very standard information. I'm not going to keep speaking as fast as I sometimes do during this section once I get into the rest of the video itself. With that said, please do note that some specific discussion of the movie may be in this section. I realize the video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. If I spoil anything other than the movie, I will verbally warn and hold it on my next finger. So, let's see. I guess there's not much. Hmm. Let's see. So, yeah. Content warning, error trigger warning, suicide, murder, torture, gaslighting, and instead of me quoting all the lines I love from this movie, let me just say here that I loved every line they put in the IMDb quote section, so you can just look that up instead of me sitting there quoting all of them. The rest of this video is not a review, it's a series of, well, thoughts. Some of it is analysis, some of it is MSC, grand retraction, other jokes, etc. Special jokes in the first uh, thoughts section. Time codes for other sections are in the description box. The section right after this one is thoughts that I have while watching, in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, and the like. The section after that is thoughts that I have while sorry, before watching. And. I don't think this movie really has empathy for characters like Charles Bromley, and ultimately, yeah, it probably would, you know, for, for, the, for the allegory, I think it works well that there are good people and evil people, even though in real life I don't think anyone is truly good or evil. And there we go. So notes taken while watching. Right at the at the start in the opening credits, the gas station lets us know that they do fill up gas during the day, since obviously not every place you can get gas would do that since they have to have stuff in place to allow for that. 
Nobody even reacts to the homeless man being, like, shock collared by the police. This is simply such a frequent occurrence. Like, at first, I was like, oh, really, you're going to have a cheap, pointless jump scare just for that? But no, it's there to say, you know, the police is constantly looking for subsiders. I mean, th this guy is only on the way to becoming a subsider, but, yeah. It is a neat touch that before you see Ethan Hawke, you see his suit, you can't see his head because it's a reflection. And one of the, you know, we're told, the signs of deterioration started with elongation of the ears, setting that up for later. She refused to turn. She's been facing the exact same direction ever since. It's nuts out there, and it's not even macadamia. The, the private that, you know, that explodes shows that, that shows that the things are not going well with the development of a blood substitute. They give it to him, then he throws up, and then he blows up. You're all thrown low. And people say, I'm a picky eater. I appreciate that at first the humans in the car do react to Edward like he's going to kill them and suck them dry. And he, ha he still has the key, so they can't drive off. But he does send the police going off in the wrong direction. And Aud Audia... Audrey. Audrey grabs his work badge, getting his full name and job title, knowing, you know, yeah. And, and she realizes he does want humans to have it better than they do, otherwise, why would he be working on a blood substitute? Happy birthday, Ed. Got that, audience? Basically, if a TV is on during this movie, it will talk about some aspect of how they're running out of blood and what is what that is leading people to do if i had to guess i'd say seven times a tv is on and we the audience hear something like that i'm not 100 percent sure i'm still trying to figure out if i think that it's doing a good job of underlining how big a problem it is or if it's excessive but like yeah you know it's it's a way to get that kind of thing across and they would have that, you know, it's not like when two characters are talking about something that both of them clearly already know. It's, it's supposed to warn the vampires. A world full of vampires I can believe, but an America where they actually take care of the needs of the troops? Now that is fiction. To clarify, I don't think that war should be used as anything other than an absolute last resort. But that doesn't mean that I don't think it's wrong for the American government to completely abandon its veterans who did exactly what it told them to do. I turned 35 ten times. Are we going to pick up exactly where we left off? And that's why it's been months since they saw each other. And a subsider shows up and starts licking the blood off the wall. I guess it got in through the door that was ajar since the security said the door was ajar. It didn't say it was closed again, and I guess the reason that Frankie just opened the door and walked in was because if he, like, rang the doorbell, his brother might pretend not to be home. So I guess the reason the subsided keeps attacking the brothers is because it sees them as an obstacle to getting the blood. You know, they did start attacking it when they saw it licking the blood. But it's, it's I, yeah, I'm just really briefly going to say, I think they do a really great job on that. Like, you have this, like, horrifying human bat, and it's licking blood off, off the walls. It picks up, like, it throws Frankie clear across the room, and, like, you know, it's it's walking upside down, and it's, like, hissing at them and, and grabbing at them and such. And they, you know, let's see. Let's see if I recall. I think, did it get... Did it get staked, or was it that... I think he, he slit its throat and then started bleeding, and then he cut its head off. Nothing like a scene featuring police dealing with a crime to get some exposition across. Hi. 
you gotta stop meeting like this. And Charles confirms what Edward basically already knew. They won't stop farming humans if the blood supply, blood substitute does work. I mean, they didn't have to force Edward to leave his UV car. L U yeah, UV covered car. Elvis could have gotten into his car for them to have the conversation. It's kind of a bit of pointless tension, and then it's like, isn't that supposed to be hurting him? Like, it's not as though he, it's not as though Edward is immune to feeling pain from, from the sun. He feels a lot of pain later when they figure out the right amount of, of sunlight to, to burn vampirism out of him. So, just, yeah. Damn it, Frankie, stop putting that gun on that human! And it's it's quite clever. The the military destroyed the I'm not sure if it was the cameras or the monitors, but something. So, you know, Edward can no longer drive the car. He needs Elvis to drive because he can just look out the window. I do appreciate that they tried to make clear why the various people in this movie get into car accidents. You know, why they didn't just pull over or something. Elvis was hallucinating. Actually, I guess Edward was also starting to hallucinate a little, wasn't he? And... And, yeah, Charles wants to make sure that Frankie isn't going to betray the vampires like Edward did. And the camera has a POV shot of Edward focusing on Claudia's neck. And because of that, they realize he must not have been drinking blood recently. <clears throat> he can't look her in the eyes. That's not an admirable trait. I owe that girl my life. She found me after I was shaped and baked, and she helped. I, I really love that, you know, she's like, the, the, the woman serving coffee, she's like, read the sign. It says, you know, we, we're only allowed to put in 5% blood. They actually bothered to put FDA approved on there. That's like, so, so, why not? Why wouldn't the FDA still run? You know, and now it's vampires, and they're trying to figure out how much blood is it okay to put in, you know, what, what's the exact, just, that's, that's, that's great. I, I really like that. Bit of world building and, and just selling it. I would say that it's ridiculously convenient that these small group of humans looking for a way to solve vampirism happened to get into a car accident with one of the only hematologists. Who knows, maybe they're always getting into car accidents with vampires and most of the time they kill them. I mean, the wine fermentation tank thing does basically make sense. And good tension as Jarvis realizes the flat tire was no accident, it was a trank dart. Pretty decent job with low budget action. You know, they use darkness to hide how many vampires there are. And yeah. I mean, if you're looking for it, you can see it. You you notice that we never actually see all that many. You know, I, I don't think. Is there a single shot that has both a, ham, a vampire? Both a vampire and a human, or a vampire and a human? See, it seems like this, where explicitly the vampire military are using trank darts on humans that make me wonder if the people who are saying, why are the vampire military always killing the people they need blood from, are even paying attention or not. You know, like, Jarvis specifically, like, he looks at it and he says, trank dart. Like, I don't, how much more do you need, people? How much more do you need to, to, and, and you see them, you see the humans in this entire scene. They, like, fall over and you see that they've been hit by a trank dart. Like, you specifically see that they don't have, like, bullet holes or something. 
yes, the military used a machine gun to try to stop the car with Edward and the humans. The way I see it, if they had managed to completely stop the car, then they would have started using trank darts. I mean, a trank dart would not penetrate the window of the car. It's not like they were using explosives or something. And Charles looks down, realizes he's bleeding, stabbed through the heart, his daughter to blame. She gives love a bad name. Again, let's do it again. Already? Man, you're on fire. More ways than one. Is this what you want to live in fear? Dude, she's ten years in. At this point, she's pretty committed. And Charles looks over the human farm and there are almost no humans left. Good visual. Allie, are you okay? Are you okay, Allie? And they see that the senator's cabin is no longer an option, but Edward says he knows someone. We see his colleagues in one line of working blood substitute. It's legitimately upsetting watching the subsiders being dragged into the sun, combusting. And Allison like grabs Frankie, who clearly does feel bad. I like that they let Frankie redeem himself like over the course of the movie he does some really awful things but once he you know what once he turns into a cured human pre-vampire I guess or post-vampire I guess yeah technically post-vamp once he post-vamps he fully does join the cause and he sacrifices himself to turn a bunch of other vampires. After we've been working together for six years, you know the sacrifices I've made. Goats, chickens. Ed, Odd, and Elvis realize that it's a trap. And Frankie turning human from feeding on Elvis is a really convenient twist, though. And Edward starts begging Charles to be turned and and, and Charles goes up to Edward and he's like, so you see, stepping on Darman's line there. So I guess Charles tied up Audrey and drove stakes, well, he probably had one of the military people do it, drove stakes through her wrists so that she would eventually give up and give information. I like how the scene opened with her sitting there in pain and him smiling. Like he's, this is not a necessary evil for him. He's enjoying this. And Frankie steps into the light. We see that cured blood turns vampires human. So the yeah, they, they put Charles in the in the elevator and he goes down, the military are all stand there with their guns out, and they all charge him and start feeding on him. One of them straight up decapitates him. Now there's a guy who knows how to get ahead. And at the end, when Ed and Audrey get attacked by a regular vampire, it it shows that, you know, they really knew how to raise the stakes. And Christopher gets crossbow from off screen. No one ever doubted that Elvis can make a strong entrance. I don't personally think that the ending is supposed to be sequel baiting. I think it's just saying that we, the viewer, have to make up our own mind on whether humans win or not. I'm, let's see, yeah, I already said that, review myself, so, let's see, what brings us to the next section, notes taken before watching. 
I guess it kind of makes sense that if a vampire bites a human who used to be a vampire, that vampire also becomes human. I mean, the blood already did carry a mutagenic virus, so it's just that the exact effect of the mutagenic virus changed. I think an argument could be made that this movie has too many car accidents as plot points. Like, basically, in this movie, if someone crashes a car, it will lead to a ma major plot progression. So, if we take the metaphor of the movie as running out of blood, equaling running out of oil, maybe subsiders are equivalent to people killed in the Middle East to secure oil, American corporations, and if it's about climate change, I guess it's about people living in those areas where the extreme conditions due to climate change lead to deaths. I'm not just... If I start commenting on Maven of the Eventides video on this movie, I'll basically just start restating everything she says. So instead, I'm going to tell you, definitely go watch her video if you haven't already. If you've watched this movie, and, and then, then you should also watch her video. Now, let's see. Right, so I listened through the audio commentary, and yeah, they talk about that, you know, the girl at the very start, you know, that's showing the, uh, what's it called, like the, the downsides of being immortal. It's that there are some, you know, it's not only, yeah, there, there are some really bad things about being immortal and they like to briefly tell the the background in in the opening credits and they gave Willem Dafoe an introduction of looks you know it feels like something out of a Sergio Leone movie and after Edward becomes human again the special forces people go in and they, you know they don't end up finding him they literally couldn't see anything through the, the, you know, and when they rehearsed it, they were like tripping all over the place and just, yeah. And they like that, you know, when, when, when Edward pretends to be a coward, you know, that they, the audience hasn't figured out what he's going to do. Originally, Originally, it was supposed to be Edward driving the car through the front of the building, but Ethan Hawke pointed out, that's not in my character, and they they were like, you're right, that's, yeah, fair enough. And so they, let's see, it's, is it Elvis now? I forget. And, yeah, so the, the... I also watched the the making of Vape Breakers, 85 minutes, and yeah, the you know, a lot of the cast are like, you know, the, I, I think that's how it opens actually. They're like, uh, no, no, I'm not a horror fan. I wouldn't say that, and just one after another after another, and you know, the the it's because like Ethan Hawke joined because of the the script, and. Yeah, they actually, they, they did a lot to, they, they really wanted Ethan Hawke for it. And, and you, yeah, it's, it is fairly written for him, isn't it? It really does play to his strengths as this kind of subdued performance with, there's, like, there's a lot of emotion there, but for a lot of the movie, he, like, it's, it's suppressed. And, but, but yeah, so they did a lot to try to convince him, and he's, he says in the, in the special features, he was he was convinced because of the script. It wasn't because of all the things they did to, to yeah. And they only had forty days to film it, so they had to plan it carefully since of all the makeup stuff. And early on Ethan Hawke had some difficulty with the makeup, the, the teeth and the ears. And the guy who plays 
um, Ethan Hawke's brother, what was it, Michael Foreman or something? He's like, Michael Dorman. You know, they, they have to cover his entire face, you know, they have to take a, a cast of his entire face to, to be able to do the, the, uh, the, the makeup properly. And, like, his, literally, like, the only, like, they have, they have the, what were those called? They, the uh, straws up, up his nose so he can breathe. But the rest of his, his head is completely covered. And he said afterwards, I got to thinking, if they pulled out the straws and covered my nostrils, no one would be able to hear, my, hear me screaming. And he talks about how you have to get used to talking with the fangs in so you're not, let's see, is it, is it, is it a lisp or a, I, f I forget, but, but yeah, you know, because once you have fangs, and I've, I've, I haven't done it on a big movie, but I'm, a small movie, yeah, I, I had fangs, and yeah, you gotta get used to how to, to, because they, they're longer than the rest of your teeth, so you either never close your teeth completely, or you have to figure out how to close your teeth properly now that, yeah, and the directors talk about that the, or was it the director? Some, someone working on the movie talk about that the the lenses for the for the eyes are you know depend on how how far gone you are you know the the normal you know if you're a vampire they're just yellow and they get more and more bloodshot as you get for further and further along and so, someone talked about how you really got get used to the feeling of having them in and that yeah I I gotta I will probably never be able to have have lenses in you know yeah I did try that once and apparently oh actually yeah it's it's been days since I watched it so I forget if this was a visual or if they just talked about this but apparently someone played played soccer using the decapitated you know like Charles Charles Bromley's decapitated head, and they talk about how the director, the the two director brothers, don't always agree. And yeah, that's that's got to be a very interesting experience. And that is oops, that is everything. So I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. If you like this video, there are quite a few more on my channel, and right around this part, right, right here at the end of the video, there should be a, a button to subscribe, there should be links to two playlists that are hopefully relevant, and let's see, so yeah, that's, yeah, that's it. So, catch you next time.